It's cute. I believe there's no such thing as fate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we come, we, we are certainly, we, we come into life with context, and we get more context as we go. Some of it's a big burden, and some of it's, you know, in, it's sort of a, a step up, but we all have power to act from that context, and that's the part that isn't fate. Okay, to volunteer, someone who hasn't shared something yet? So everything happens for a reason. Uh, I'll go. Yeah. Um, that um, sort of looking back on my life, I don't believe that everything happens for a predestined reason, but I think looking looking back, um, we sort of talked about doors in our groups, and that sometimes the, the doors that open and the doors that close are equally meaningful and kind of stringing the beads together to get you where you are. And then in this corner, it's, I believe, in second chances. Yeah, okay, I'll go. I'm gonna nominate um, I, I, I just I believe in, in risk and I think risk carries with it an inherent uh, belief in second chances, especially for a field where you're putting yourself out there and should be allowed to fail and have the community give us have as much generosity as you give to them to be able to try again and hopefully succeed in producing different. And in this corner, I believe in love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling you when I was 27, I went to a bar in New York, and uh, these two older gay men, who were probably the same age I am now, got into a really heated argument that got to that point where everybody started getting quiet, like something bad's going to happen. But one of the guys, I'm dating myself, but one of the guys is really funny to me, like Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. And I started laughing, and I looked across the room of all these guys over there, and there was one other guy laughing. And as soon as those guys were done, I walked over and introduced myself, and we've been together for 25 years. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you, everyone, for kind of identifying yourselves in these spaces. And you know, like I said, tomorrow, if you did this exercise again, maybe you would be in a, a different place. But one of the things that we do with Unzaba Elements is you're looking at a group of people who, on the surface, may look like they have nothing in common. And then you find these places of overlap and experience and sort of setting up these opportunities for people to connect over something that's maybe different than what you would expect. Or maybe they would never have walked into that same space in the room if they didn't have that that opportunity to share something that connected them. So we're looking for those mysterious places of intersection and connection. I lost my thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, think, think on it and then we'll... Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Do you do, you do anything around 12-step rooms or recovery? Not no. to this date, although we certainly work with people who have been in recovery. But mm -hmm. you're, just, you're just describing yeah. what it is to be in a in one of those rooms. Just the real power of it is you look across the room and you go, oh, I know what that person is. Oh, I, I, know, I know what I wanted to say was, was it's, it's related to this in a way, is that um, the Undesirable Elements series was very much about um, an audience entering a room, seeing the six or seven people up there from six or seven you know different worlds or, or cultures or whatever. And it's really about recognizing that we may have differences, but we have more in common as human beings than we have differences. And that's what the Undesirable Elements is about, is creating that bridge, that space where people can look and say, he doesn't look like me, but you know, I suddenly realize we're human beings. And that's the bottom line. And so that's a big part of our Undesirable Elements. And the second, to, to speak out of your, to tell your story is to empower yourself. You know, and I'll just give one example very quickly, and then we can move on. You know, we had a, a woman from the Congo who had been raped. Her child was murdered. Her husband was murdered. She was raped multiple times, and uh, she wouldn't tell her story on stage as her own story. She said, it's, "I'm speaking for somebody else." And we did it in six different venues, but at the last venue, and sadly, I don't know if we'll ever do this again. She said, "I'm ready to tell it as my own story." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to quickly move into a staging yeah. section. Yeah, that's just a, a, a perfect a segue because, yes, this is the exploration, these are the stories, and now, ultimately, we're a theater company, and so we want, we put those shared experiences into a piece. 
written and directed by uh, the company. And that's exactly what we're going to do um, in the next seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, creativity and limitation. I'm going to give you the uh, uh, criteria, uh, uh, and then I'll put you into four groups. Um, so, uh, things that need to be addressed in this one minute piece that you'll create together. Uh, your names. Just your names. Everyone needs to say their full name. Um, and you should all address a bullet point. A bullet point that was in your packet. It could be any of these corners uh, that you did say. It could be uh, a na the naming behind your names. We were doing the forms, which you so generously filled out. It could be all of those, and that could be a bullet point. So the content are your names and uh, the a bullet point. Uh, and then, so in the form, you're going to be seated in chairs, and you're going to use claps as punctuation and transitions. That's it. Seated, using claps, and the content is your names and a bullet point. Uh, and those elements of staging, so the work that we do, we think, we look at it as elements of staging. Um, today, the elements of staging are those four bullet points. So we'll put you in four groups, so let me just... Four groups of six. Oh, one last yeah. thing I, I wanted to mention was that I, the technique of interviewing each other is something that's uh, mm -hmm. fundamental to undesirable elements. Mm -hmm. But this approach has also generated my interdisciplinary work as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it has a, a external uses as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So six. Okay, great. So I will take.
should identify yourself in the process. My name is my
My middle name is because my mother didn't like her mother's name, and my first name is because my grandmother didn't like my mother's choice. <laughs> if I was a boy, I would have been Andrew, not a scientist. <laughs> uh, everyone in my family, or many people in my family, have the middle name of Andy. His family loved literature, so Robert Louis Stevenson. I identify as a daughter probably because I've lost both my parents and I have to tell myself every day mm -hmm. that I'm a daughter. sounding names were made fun of that people that we just chose a name. But that's my real name. Abaka goes all the way back to the Ga culture of Ghana on my matrilineal side. There was a story of two women who were being separated from each other. They were sisters to go on separate slave ships and they promised each other that they would never forget their last name. And that was Abaka. And as the women were braiding the hair and making the food through time, they talk about it, talk about it, until my grandmother told me, that's my, that is my real name. My name is Allison Marie de la Cruz. I was named after my maternal grandfather, Allison, my paternal grandmother, Maria, and the Spanish colonizers who made my family take the name de la Cruz. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is James Savage Royce, and oh, mm -hmm. my name is James Savage Royce, and my first and last name go back 600 years in a, uh, in, a in a line of only men. We have never born. Fiorella is a name on my jersey. I was a dancer and I felt anonymous. That name on the back of my jersey took care of that. I never really liked my body and when I put the gear on, I could really reach my full potential. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Antonello Alfredo Di Benedetto. Both my parents were born in Italy and they met in Chicago. And on my father's side, the tradition would be that I'd be named after my grandfather, Alfredo. The same year I was born, my uncle on my dad's side had a son and they named him Alfredo. So my mom refused to have two Alfredos in the family in the same year. I was born on St. Anthony's Day, so they named me after my grandmother, Antonietta, and they just did a variation. So I'm Italian. <laughs> <laughs> my first name is Erica. My parents were going to name me Emily, but they looked up uh, the meaning in one of those baby name books, and it's, uh, the meaning of Emily was sideline sitter. And my mother, as a strong woman of the 1970s, did not like that. And a few pages later, she found Erica, uh, which means ever strong and powerful. Right underneath, or maybe right above, it said Eric, the male variation, which only meant ever strong. So she chose Erica. <laughs> David is my father's name. Augustus came from my mother's grandfather, Frederick Henry Augustus Andres. He was known as Grand Gus, and uh, that was always going to be my name. My mother could not call me Gus when I was a baby, so I was Davy. And when I was three, I walked into a room full of adults, and I walked around introducing myself as Gus. I don't remember this, but apparently that's what happened. <laughs> 
My name is Bradley Roy Erickson. Roy was the name of my father's father, who died not long before I was born, um, so I never met him. Um, I've never liked the name Roy, and I've always felt guilty because I felt like I should, since it was um, you know, my grandfather's name who I never met, but I don't like it. My name is Ilana, with an I, named after my grandfather Israel, who I never met. Um, in my waking ones, uh, but who um, I have a picture of, and I have a deep connection to, and, and I don't really know why. I don't know him. Um, and Ilana means tree. My name is Amanda Kathleen Ezekiel Delheimer Diamond. Um, most of the names I got in the normal way, except for Ezekiel, which I chose for myself as a confirmation name, because I desperately did not want to be confirmed. My mom assured me that my grandmother would die if I did not. Um, so I agreed to, and the most obnoxious I could think I could think of as a 15-year-old was to name myself as a deal. My name is Abraham Phillips Rybeck, and the Phillips is not plural. Um, like, there were two guys named Phil that I was named <laughs> after. It's somebody's last name, my great aunt Edna Phillips who was a lesbian who was a teacher of my grandmother's when my grandmother, um, her whole family was killed in the flu epidemic in 1918. And this teacher, Edna, brought her in and um, became like a mother to her. And um, if I had been a girl, I would have been Edna instead of having a middle name Phillips. And I, that, could have been a great scenario because I, I can't really see myself as a dyke named Ed. Like if anyone wants to leave us with with a final reflection. 